Good morning, Wabash. Good morning. Today, speaking at Pioneer Chapel is Professor Wysocki with her talk entitled The Imperfect Imposter. Professor Wysocki is an organic chemist in her ninth year at Wabash. Her research interests involve the synthesis of fluorescent dyes and science communication. She graduated from Northwestern University in 2003 and received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2008. She spent some time at Howard Hughes Medical Institute before arriving at Wabash in 2011. She lives nearby with her husband, Coach Olmsted, their daughter, Abigail, and their crazy dog, Holly. She is a fan of all things Wabash, along with the Packers, the Badgers, and March Madness. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wysocki. Good morning, Wabash. <laughs> and on the 187th anniversary of the college's founding, I'll also say happy birthday, Wabash. <laughs> First, I'd like, yeah, let's have a birthday party. All right. First, I'd like to say thanks to the Sphinx Club for the invitation to speak today. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for being here. Chapel Talks might be my favorite Wabash tradition, so it's a real honor to be on this side of the podium. I was a little hesitant about going right after the Monon Bell Chapel because there's simply no way to match that energy. And let's face it, Artie is a better storyteller than I will ever be. <laughs> But after the game last weekend, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be up here so I can publicly say that I am incredibly proud to be a part of this Wabash community. <laughs> I'm proud of the hard work and determination of every member of our football team, coaches and players, who gave everything they had. And I'm especially proud of what I saw after the clock uh, went to zero. I admire the players who reacted with maturity and strength, rather than with anger and frustration when the opposing fans rushed the field and disrespected our team. And I'm grateful for those students who stayed behind to clean our bleachers and our tailgate area. Thank you to everyone who chose to do the right thing after a heartbreaking outcome. You inspire me to be better. Last time I was up here for a chapel talk, I had a little secret. I had butterflies in my stomach for more than just nerves. My husband and I knew we had a baby on the way, but we hadn't shared the news yet. Now, Abigail's already two years old, and she already loves all things Wabash. W was the first letter she knew. Red was her first color. Wabash was the first word she could read. And she sings the chorus of Old Wabash with surprising accuracy. Seriously. <laughs> Every once in a while, she even reminds me out of the blue that Wabash always fights. Now, you can feel free to judge my parenting at this point in the talk, um, but part of the reason Abigail uh, is already brainwashed is because of the kindness of this community. Whether we're hanging out in Mommy's office, visiting friends in Center Hall, or burning energy in the Allen Center, you all make her feel like Wabash is a second home. Coach Morrell and his staff make the football team feel like family, and I couldn't ask for a more loving and playful environment for my daughter. A couple weeks ago, Paul Jefferson from the class of 92 mentioned in his chapel talk that having a child was like watching a part of you exist outside your body. And I couldn't agree more. When our daughter was a baby, she lived for this giant green Lego. She looked for it as soon as she woke up. We had to have it on every car ride, and it shows up in almost every picture. Um, but it was funny, you could set out all of the giant Legos, and she would only be happy with that one. No other shape. No other color. And as she played with the Legos, we noticed she was kind of organizing them. Colors were generally grouped, oop, colors were generally grouped together, or sometimes they were sorted by size, and she would properly arrange any Legos that happened to be on their side when we dumped out the bag. That's when Olmi and I looked at each other with a sense of panic. Uh, that poor girl inherited our personalities, as well as our eye color and facial features. Anyone who's visited Coach Olmi's office knows that there is a place for everything. Attention to detail is on his list of admirable qualities, and being somewhere on time means 10 minutes early, which I'm not very good at. <laughs> it might not surprise you to hear that I'm a bit of a perfectionist myself. Um, this isn't news to anyone who's taken my courses. In Chem 101, sig figs are important. 
And in organic, those arrows are saying something, so they better not be pointing to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I've been that way for a long time. Uh, in high school, I remember my English teacher telling my mom that she gave me an A- minus on an assignment because everyone should experience what it's like to be less than perfect, not because there was anything wrong with my paper. I worked hard and school came naturally to me, but I think we can all agree that college is a little different. Here's some of my story. I went to Northwestern University and was part of the integrated science program, which had about 25 students per year and included taking courses that counted toward a major in biology, chemistry, physics, or math, and there was some geology and neuroscience thrown in there too. Certainly, you had to have good numbers to be in this program, but I mostly chose it because I was indecisive. Um, I knew I liked science and I had no idea what type, so this sounded good to me. I got to experience small class sizes and interesting professors while being part of this close cohort of students. So it was really Wabash-like in some ways. I very quickly learned that while I had the numbers to be in the program, I was in this, the middle of this pack. I remember as a freshman having to build up the nerve to talk to a professor, and in one case that's seared in my memory, I didn't do as well on an exam as I had hoped and I was still confused about the material. So I went in for my professor's office hours and I asked him if he could explain how to solve one of the problems. I can still hear his response. What grade did you get on this test? If you don't understand how to do that, I should probably regrade it because you deserve a D. Now, maybe he was trying to make a joke, uh, but I was absolutely horrified. Uh, I assured him everything was crystal clear now and I got out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> I pulled off a B plus in that course and I counted myself lucky. As a sophomore, I took my first chemistry class, Orgo. You might guess that I was a rock star since that class inspired my career. My first quiz was a 56%. Quiz number two, I improved to a 57%. And my first midterm was a 66%. So I was putting things like 10 electrons on a nitrogen and an oxygen. It's like I'd never heard of the octet rule. I was totally lost. That's for my science students. <laughs> okay. um, this was not one of those classes with a huge curve. I was straight up failing. I was desperate enough to overcome that intimidation I felt, and I went to the professor's office hours. And I ended up in tears, assuring him that I knew what was going on, I knew what I was doing, I just couldn't show it on an exam. He saw my desperation and responded with patience and a few suggestions on how to study. The next quiz I was all the way up to an 80%, and from that point on, I found myself in the 90s. I still don't know exactly what changed my trajectory, but if you have ever struggled in a course and wondered if your professor understood how that felt, I have been there and I absolutely understand. The, um, I keep those exams in a folder right here, but in my office too, just to remind me of a couple of things. First, that what I teach is not intuitive to anyone the first time they see it. But second, that a rocky start can sometimes lead to success and everyone deserves that chance to succeed. When I got to grad school, I was a small fish in a big pond once again. And before my very first test, which was meant to be review from undergrad, everyone was throwing around this word, diastereotopic. Seemed important. I had no idea what it meant. I panicked. Uh, every other person used it like it was a normal word, and I had never heard it, and I couldn't find it anywhere in the notes. I started to think my Northwestern education didn't amount to very much, uh, since it didn't even prepare me for the review exam in grad school. There's no way I would be able to cut it. Honestly, it's more likely that my professors taught me what diastereotopic meant. I just never learned it. Um, but in either case, I begged someone who seemed friendly to study with me. He reluctantly agreed, because after all, he didn't need to study, he already knew it, and he was kind enough to answer all my stupid questions. After that, I studied like crazy and ended up getting 102% on that exam. Yeah, I just outworked everybody else. <laughs> um, but I earned my professor's respect, and he never knew that it came out of a place of fear. That made me even more terrified now that I would let him down at some point in the future. It didn't end there. On a later exam in that same course, there was a student who had a question about the calculations on the key that was posted online, and my professor in front of the whole class said that he never really did the calculations, he just looked at a student's exam that he trusted. And then he winked at me. 
I turned beet red and was horrified. I mean, now, what if I was wrong? Now I'm gonna be publicly wrong and everyone's gonna know that I'm an idiot? Thanks a lot. So, <laughs> to be honest, I never repeated that initial dominance in the class, but no one ever called me out for being an idiot either. So, that's a win. Um, and to this day, when I run into that professor at conferences, he still likes to tell the story of that girl with 102% on the exam. At the end of that orgo course, I earned an A. And at the end of that grad school course, I earned an A. And if you just looked at my transcript, you'd have no idea what it took to get there. Years later, the successes are highlighted and the bumps in the road can just be left out of the narrative. But trust me, they are hard to forget. Whether it's the impressive professional resume or the social media effect where everyone posts photos that are perfect and happy, uh, people put their best selves forward and that's never the whole story. There's rejection, there are major struggles, and there is outright failure along the way. I think it's important to own that and to admit it. I've seen a lot of you guys do that, and I have to be grateful uh, uh, for everything that you do. For me, the first paper coming out of my lab at Wabash was rejected in less than 48 hours. It usually takes weeks or months to get feedback on a paper, so this was a hard no, okay? I was devastated. But what you see on my resume is that the same paper was published in a higher impact journal just a few months later. Also, I've been rejected for four grant proposals that I've written. You'll never see that on my resume, but you will see the two that I successfully uh, earned. Any success comes with failure and every professor here knows and has had a taste of both. As I progressed in my career, I started to feel like everyone else had it figured out. Someone gave me the advice to fake it until you make it, and that sounded good to me. Projecting confidence is a good thing, and experience will teach volumes, so it's important to jump in and get working. The problem with that strategy is it comes with the fear that someone will eventually find out that you've been faking it all along. A few years into my time at Wabash, I heard this term called imposter syndrome, and I immediately knew that I could relate. Basically, it means that a person feels like they are inadequate or a fraud, despite evidence of their success. I think I always felt that, but when I got my dream job at Wabash, the feeling intensified because there were higher stakes, and I had more to lose when someone inevitably found me out. Don't get me wrong, in some ways, this feeling of inadequacy can be a source of motivation. After all, it's hard to become complacent if you've never really made it. You might work harder, put out a better project, and achieve more. This definitely happened to me. Look at how that grad school class went. My professor still remembers me in the sea of students that he taught um, just because of that initial grade. There's no doubt that I am my worst critic, so by the time I put something out on the public stage, whether it's a lecture in my class, an exam I've written, a paper I've submitted, or a chapel talk, I've thought about each detail for hours on end. But there is a cost. Along with the quality work I was producing, I had this looming feeling of self-doubt. None of it really mattered if I was an imposter in the first place. At Wabash, I remember the first hire I took part in on the hiring committee. I read other people's application for the position, and I, I honestly had no idea how my application convinced anybody to give me a chance. A very large part of me felt like I was hired because people liked me as a person, not because I was qualified. I would hesitate to ask for help because I imagine someone might discover that I know less than they had given me credit for. I'd rather work 10 times harder to figure it out on my own than to lose someone else's respect. I could hear dozens of compliments and evaluations, but I chalked them up to simple kindness and only saw the truth in the criticism, usually the harsh words I had for myself. I found it easy to avoid applying for competitive grants and awards because I felt like it was obvious I wouldn't get them. Luckily, I listened to those who encouraged me to try these things because I had an equally strong sense that I didn't want to let anyone down by ignoring their advice. Any success I had, though, came with a qualifier in my mind. For example, if I had high attendance at a seminar, it was probably because there wasn't anything scheduled against it and everybody loves free pizza. Everyone has their own situation, but you might be seeing some of yourself reflected in these personal thoughts of mine. It's clear as I say these things out loud that this kind of thinking is a real problem. 
Not only does it show low self-esteem, but it can lead to a lot of missed opportunities. That loud voice of doubt can change the way you carry yourself in high-stakes situations. When you downplay your own accomplishments, there might not be someone else there to display your work. Not to mention the inevitable burnout from trying to do it all on your own. If you don't put yourself out there, you might miss strong mentoring relationships that are critical for professional and personal growth. So here's the bottom line. If you feel like any of this makes sense to you, what can you even do about it? First of all, know that you are not alone. So many people feel this way, seriously. I was shocked to realize I was surrounded by people who could relate, and I let out a sigh of relief when I found this out. Know that your professors, your coaches, your mentors, we are not perfect. I was failing organic chemistry, right? No one is perfect. If you're comparing yourself to someone's resume image, then it's an unfair comparison in the first place. Allow yourself the grace to be a little bit imperfect. It's incredibly uncomfortable for a perfectionist, right? But it's the only way to grow. When it comes to your experience as a student, understand that your professors are not judging you by the grade you get in their class. The comments we leave on exams and papers are feedback about the work itself, not the human being who produced that work. I can think of dozens of students who didn't do very well in my classes, but whom I respect, admire, and would count as friends. Often students apologize for a poor grade or feel this crippling embarrassment when they say something incorrect in front of me. That's totally unnecessary, okay? You need to make mistakes to learn, and if you make them in front of me, it's actually an opportunity for me to help you understand something more clearly. That's my job, and I love it, so it's okay. Learn how to take criticism. Now this is a hard one. I still carry scars from negative comments that thousands of compliments can't fully heal. If you feel harshly judged, then take some time to collect yourself. Try to find the truth in the criticism. Reflect on whether it's something worthwhile to address, and if so, find an appropriate way to respond. Focus on smaller goals. It's easy to fall short of perfection. It's even easier to lose motivation when that A seems further and further out of reach. But you can work to understand the next assignment and find better time management and look for more effective ways to study and even see your professor and eventually you might get closer to that A than you thought you would. Even if an A isn't in your future, I am certain you'll learn something valuable along the way. Change your mindset. Quite frankly, I've learned this strategy from my two-year-old. She definitely likes things a certain way, but if she can't do it, she doesn't always scream or give up. She asks for help. She works at it. She tries a different approach or even changes the rules of whatever made-up game she was playing. If you hear yourself saying something like, how can I succeed in this class? I can't even understand the homework. Put a yet at the end of that sentence. I can't understand the homework yet. The first statement is a hopeless one and makes it easy to give up. The second statement gives you the power to do something about it. Recognize what you're feeling so you can actually do something before it has a negative impact. I'm not sure that my imposter syndrome will ever really go away. Just last year, I gave a talk at a conference filled with international heavy hitters in my field. I had the same amount of time and the same audience that they did, and I was terrified. I knew I was the only primarily undergraduate institution represented there, so alongside the research, I talked about what thoughtful work you guys do at small institutions. You guys are the main researchers, and you are the first authors on the papers. Afterwards, several people whose work I respected, but I didn't know before this conference, came up to me to tell me that they appreciated my talk and thought we were doing good things at Wabash. My immediate thought was that I really work in a kind discipline where people are so polite to say those things. And I was really disappointed in myself when I realized what I was saying. The truth is, those compliments were not just politeness, and I am damn proud of what we do here at Wabash. Finally, make a list of accomplishments, or in my case, true compliments. 
I have a secret file in my email, which isn't going to be so secret anymore. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, I receive a compliment from a student or a colleague that I respect, and I put it in that folder. When I'm having my worst days, I can go to those emails and try to convince myself that the imposter thoughts are wrong. Human kindness is an invaluable tool against self-doubt. Be kind to others and accept kindness yourself. By the way, the first time I saved a compliments file was after my chapel talk in 2013. I came across it writing this talk and it still brings tears to my eyes. Most of the compliments that I chose to save all those years ago said something about how I was a good fit for Wabash. Without knowing anything about imposter syndrome or anything I've talked about today, I knew that in my toughest moments, I would need to be reminded that I belong here. Don't forget that you belong here too. Thank you for helping this imposter find a place to call home. Wabash always fights. <laughs>